This is Meet the Poet. What um, would you do if someone got your, one of your poems tattooed on them? I wouldn't want to know about it. You wouldn't? No. Oh, God, what have you done? See, that's a good question. Some people are being called out today. Yeah. My name is Flory Crass, and today we are here in the fine city of Norwich on this fine, rainy day to meet with poet Lewis Buxton and discuss his poetry collection, Boy in Various Poses. Now it is here where Julian of Norwich resided and wrote the first book ever written by a woman in the English language in 1395. It's also where the first poem was written in blank verse. It has 600 pubs, it is a medieval city, and you might know it as the hometown of Alan Partridge. How very inspiring. A boy becomes a brooding hen. A boy wants a baby. Dreams of being a father. Practices midlife crises. Crocodile tears in the shower. Boy wants to lay an egg, but looks down at his body, presses his belly outward, moon held in his hands. He listens to the water under his skin. He imagines himself running with a buggy looks at his friends with babies. He's jealous of their casual fatherhood, their Sundays and car keys. Boy thinks he'd like to have a boy and for that boy to be a dancer. He touches his nipples and asks, what are these? Memories of the parent I could have been when I was a half formed thing, sexless and drifting in water. Why did you feel it was important to write about boyhood? We have an idea of uh, gender and um, both girlhood and boyhood um, or childhood um, and adolescence as being singular in some way, right? That there are particular rites of passage, that there are particular um, ideas of what a boy should be or a girl should be. And it, it's, it's sort of always preoccupied me, like growing up and being a boy. And, and that I felt slightly uh, ill at ease with boyhood, with being a boy, with the ways in which I was supposed to present or talk or act. Um, I was a very sensitive boy. I think I felt the world incredibly keenly. Mm. And that always seemed to be at odds with the, the ways people told me to be. Mm -hmm. or the way people expected me to be. And then there were this bunch of other things to do with boyhood that I was very comfortable with and that I really liked, you know, mm -hmm. football, beards. I never felt a need to, um, or an interest in expressing my gender in any sort of visual or sartorial way, but I did feel uh, a need to do that in like an emotional way. So I was thinking about all of this and then I sort of like stumbled across a, like a way of writing about boys or a boy mm -hmm. um, that could contain the multitudes of, of boyhood, that could contain the multitudes of um, experience. And it's um, it sort of all spurred off of this um, bit in uh, Judith Butler's book, Gender Trouble, where she asks the question, uh, what are the political possibilities of radically questioning our existing categories of gender, right? And so that's what this is. It's just mm. questions. It's not me going like, here's a solution mm. to gender. Here's a solution to um, any issues or like legal, political or otherwise. It's just me being like, I've got some questions, man, because I don't understand this. Yeah. I was interested why it is a boy and not a man. There are two reasons that it's a boy and not a man. The first is that I don't know what a man is. I don't feel like one. Every time I'm around other men, Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I see them as men, but I, I see myself, I sort of think of myself as younger. Maybe that was the thing, like, growing up I always had older friends. I still sort of do. Like, yeah. not in like, I'm in with the cool kids, but just like, all my mates are sort of a few years not older than brag, me. Not to brag, but they're Not to brag, but like, yeah. they're all, um, they're all older than me. The other thing is like, phonically, I think it's more interesting. Boy mm -hmm. is plosive, it's, um, sort of, you know, boy is buoyant. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's like, a, it's a fun word. Is that like, specifically gendered, or is that also something that you think is just inherent in aging as a boy or a girl, that it's like the idea of adulthood rather than childhood. I think definitely in like the UK and America, the mm. definition of a man, it's posed in the negative 
to feminine attributes, right? So mm. somebody who is aggressive, who's confident, who's not feminine, who, you know, does butch manly things, whatever those butch and manly things are. I think in other cultures, uh, the idea of a man is the opposite to being a boy, or it's the progression of, of being a boy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it is the, the growing up into, into adulthood. And I think that is the definition of man that I'm more interested in. Mm. I don't feel particularly adult. I don't feel particularly grown up. Um, I mean, I hear so many adults saying that, that it's not, that it's just like, the idea of being an adult is seems so unattainable in so many ways that you sort of yeah. you know, feel like you get to that point where you're like, oh, I'm as... I'm as secure and as stable and as sorted out as that person who yeah. is an adult to me. I'm sure, like, I'll become a parent and I won't consider myself an adult. Like, that's the, the you know, the imposter syndrome of uh, our lives. A boy runs out of his lungs, like there are coats held by a parent at a school gate. The world around him is closing. Shops pulling down shutters as he turns into a cemetery where his heels press the dead further into their graves. He feels the weight on his ankle that crumpled beneath him months ago. He didn't listen to the physio or do the exercises she gave him. He hoped he would heal himself, that in deepening the wound he would make it more heroic, grow back into the bruised ligaments until his breathing was a spooked horse, Spittle, rattling from his cheeks, the bit between his teeth worn away by worrying the whip of hundreds of fathers, keeping him going, going, going. These sort of, like, vignettes, these moments, do you relate to them all? Are they all you? Are they other boys, like, sort of brought in? I mean, there's a part of me that is is interested in stuff. Why do you care whether or not this is me? Mm. Um... And whether or not this is my experience, whether it's that the experience of like getting a hand job at a park or having a fight with your brother or getting married, right? I'll, I'll fall into the sort of death of the author camp and be like, yeah, that's fine. It doesn't really matter yeah. um, what I think or what the actual experience was. More than anything, because it goes through the sort of mimetic lens of a poem, right? The minute you write something down, especially in something as constructed as a poem and something as sort of like adherent to rule and form or or whatever and especially the way these poems are i don't know how close to life you can ever get it to be um really what people are asking is how close do they feel to my life Mm. And, and it's about them it's about how how they receive the poem um and i think for me um, I think a lot of the, the the book is informed by like my personal life and I'm me being like, yeah, sure, why not? And I fall very much into the two categories of like what um, Caroline Bird says before um, a lot of her readings. She says all of these, these poems are true, but there are no facts. And then um, what Sharon Old says when people ask her about like, is this true? Are these, is, this, is this about you? Is this personal? And she says, well, it's apparently personal. It exists in that sort of hazy world between those two things Mm -hmm. but i understand that people care about biography people care about um what what your experience and what your life is because they want to see truth Mm -hmm. they want and they want to make sure it's not affected and i think that's totally fair Mm -hmm. they want to be like well if you're telling me this story i want to know how much of this is true and people don't want to feel betrayed that's so true and i don't know if i've heard it said that way before but you feel like in reading it you you kind of open yourself up to this thing and you want to feel like what your experience, because of if, if this is true, you want to feel that your experience of it is genuine. Yeah. I remember I read um, uh, Max Porter's Grief is the, is the Thing with Feathers. Was it here? Which is somewhere around here. Yes. I, yeah. See, um, I mention that all the time. That is probably my favourite book ever. So it's about a Ted Hughes scholar whose wife dies suddenly and he's left to look after his two sons and he can't, cope with that from grief and so Crow, the sort of folkloric figure that arrives in a lot of Ted Hughes's work, mm. arrives in the house to babysit. All of that that goes on, that whole tale of grief, the whole sort of like absurdity of it. You know, I remember people feeling betrayed by they were like, but Max Porter's wife hasn't died and he's not a Ted Hughes scholar. Mm. And I remember Porter's like saying things about like, this is an articulation of grief and like the way in which grief has worked for me in my life mm. and didn't need to say any more for me, doesn't need to say any more. Frightened Rabbit. 
Gone boy. Boy lost, but still running. Trainers pounding the ground. Looking for a river. Frightened rabbit. Richie Edwards. Jeff Buckley. Fuck me. This can't be the way it ends. Chandler from Friends. Ross not knowing how to be lonely. Because we can't all fuck like Joey. We so rarely know our bodies. We might drown in our own bloodstream. Wiped clean surface. Blood. Sunlight. Darkness sits with you in the pub. Grab life by the free pawn. Wine. Whiskey. Clean white shirts that do not show the hurt. Our bodies are piano keys that girls press softly. They are rubbing the skin from our knuckles whilst we beg for attention. One study reveals a rise in men with erectile dysfunction. Fist language. Knuckles leave speech marks, die hard, wife beater vests. We know our best dressed heroes by what they've done to their partners. Frightened rabbit. Fights in the street. Why me? Cry football. Cry rugby. This is the first time you've hugged me. Boy in the club. Grandad in the navy. We all have tequila salt in our wounds, baby. Punch drunk. Hunched up. Dumb luck. Club shuts. The battery on our phones runs red as blood. Shout when you think you've had enough. We will keep going anyway. We need to talk gut. But what we talk is bullshit. Dog bark. Frightened rabbit. Language is beyond our grasp and we are talking too loud in all this music. Men need to put their hands to the earth and say sorry. But we know our muscles look best in shadow. Stressed as bruised apple. Closed millennial. Moisturiser and shaving cream. Cutthroat razors trying to save us from ourselves. Pink button down. Garish tie. Every colour does some violence to the eye. Every father does some violence to the boy. And every boy does some violence to themselves. Dying is safer than saying what I feel. Pull on coat of muscle, bulletproof denim, bad dreams, broken ankles, depression battles fought with toy swords and water pistols. Pray, look up to heaven, brave new haircut David Beckham, barber shave too close to the skin, you can see our raw pinkness, our baby faces, we cut ourselves on blades of grass. The world is a knife held to our throats. Moving from the personal side of it then, mm -hmm. and thinking a bit bigger, the people who have heard these poems, and I mean boys as well as girls, mm. how have they reacted to it? What have they said to you about the poems? When people come up to you after shows, they, they say very odd things. After an hour of me telling a story, um, an adaptation of this book, um, which is a show called Boy, um, and an hour of me talking on stage with a microphone on my own and telling the story of Boy, um, a man came up to me and said, oh my God, that was like a one man show. And it, I'm sort of like, <laughs> yeah, that was, that's what it, that, that's, that's what I was going for. But it's still on the tin. The look on a person's face when I'm reading a poem and it's profoundly moving them mm. and it is you know that Alan Bennett thing of like when you read something and you find a thought that you believe to be peculiar to you and here it is written down by somebody that you've never met maybe somebody long dead and it's as if somebody's reaching out a hand so that audience member that I'm reaching out a hand to and I'm looking them in the eye their facial expression is exactly the same as somebody's facial expression that is terribly bored by the whole proceedings yeah right it's the same thing <laughs> mm. uh, my mum doesn't like them i don't think um she doesn't like the poems at all she doesn't comment on them 
I think she. Um, Did she... you see it as like a reflection on her parenting? No, I don't think it's that. I think it's to, that she doesn't feel equipped to 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 read or understand the poems. Mm. Um, I think she thinks there's something else going on with them. I'm like, no, mum, it's just about it's it's just about playing football. Like, it's really not mm. much more than that. She thinks she's wrong as a reader mm. because they don't affect her. But then I'm like, if they don't affect you, they don't affect you. That's fine. Like, you don't have to like them. You like me. Like, um, yeah. there are loads of poets who I like as a person and I don't really like their poems. Yeah. There are other poets I really like their poems, really don't like them as people. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, would you like a list? No. Um, <laughs> this is where we get, like, dish the dirt. <laughs> boy wonder. A boy responds to panic lights in the sky, beating criminals to a pulp in his mind. Biff. Bang. Boff. Pow. Boy Wonder wakes each morning covered in a night sky of bruises he's forced to hide. He tries to address himself, goes to Top Man in search of something scarlet or forest green, loses the sculpted plastic, the fireproof cape. Holy fragility, Batman, he shouts, reveling in his capacity to be afraid, telling himself that to be Robin is to give honour where there's always been shame. Poems are sort of one of two things. They're either um, moments of high emotion that you can only possibly understand at a wedding or a funeral, right? Mm -hmm. I think still probably one of the most famous poems in our culture is Funeral Blues as read by John Hanna in Four Weddings and a Funeral, right? Yeah. Which is wicked and like genuinely I hate to say it, that is sort of one of the things that really got me into poems. Yeah. Like, it's like people either think it's it's for those. The other thing is that people think the poems are Rubik's Cubes, right? People mm -hmm. think that they're these like puzzles that need to be solved. They are these things that are gorgeous, high moments of emotion. But there's also um, something to be said for like, they're these like, they're, there are poems which you feel like, and you can take great pleasure in unlocking. Mm -hmm. They can also be like these profound and glorious mysteries. Like there are loads of, um, uh, the poet Ella Frias, uh was talking about just like the atmosphere of a poem, right? Mm. Like, you don't need to understand what a poem is about. Like, what's the atmosphere? Like, what, what kind of weird tingly feeling does it give you? And, and you can lean into the mystery of it. Like, you can lean into, like, I don't get this, mm. right? But in the same way, people get, like, song lyrics tattooed on them. It's not that they understand them in the way that people are supposed to understand poetry, but it means something to them, right? Same as, you know, people get poems tattooed onto them. Um, what do you do if someone got your, one of your poems tattooed on them? I wouldn't want to know about it. You wouldn't? No. Oh God, what have you done? Nothing. <laughs> and depends Nothing, on, I swear. It, it sort, of, sort of depends on the poem, depends on... Um, Every me the poet guess now has a tattoo. Yeah, 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 it depends on, it depends on... Oh, the other thing, like in terms of like my ethos, you asked like what the ethos of the yeah. poem is, right? Um, uh, it's sort of hard for me, it's entertainment. I got the feeling, reading through it all, that there was also just a sense of, almost as the poet fathering throughout. I don't know if that's sort of like, mm. in creating the poems, or sort of nurturing these spaces where the boy can be created. Yeah, I, I feel um, poorly equipped to be the father of these poems. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but it's interesting you talk about it actually, because um, Again, part of it came from part of this poem in particular, but lots of the poems, mm. and like some in some ways, like the language came from Denise Riley's book "Say Something Back" and her long poem um, "A Part Song," uh, which is about the loss of her son. Boy, undressing. Boy removes himself from his body, pulls off his shoulders, undoes his ribs. Begins the slow unscrewing of hair from thighs, lining up each strand on the nightstand and leaving him with a baby baldness. He unlatches each ankle before removing his feet. The shins are delicate today as he shelves them carefully next to his kneecaps in the cupboard. Reaching into his gut, he scoops out the day's ablutions and finds a clump of stress he did not know he was digesting. After brushing them, he puts his teeth on the sink next to the taps and places what's left of his spit in a small bowl. He drained his sweat, cum and blood earlier in the evening. His hair fits perfectly on the mannequin on his vanity table. Looking in the mirror, 
He removes his beard, his chest, and, gently, his genitals. He falls into bed, wearing nothing but his thoughts. I love this poem. I love yeah. this idea of... Um, because the the collection Boy in Various Poses is really this idea of like physicality as well, because yeah. it's like poses and the body comes into it so much. And here the idea of the, the body literally being taken apart and it's so visceral and very raw. And then also you get to the end and he's still wearing his thoughts. You mm. can't get rid of that. But that, I think, is such a cool poem in its weirdness. Um, and... Is it this one or there was another one? I was just thinking when you mentioned Max Porter. Oh wait. Oh, so like Feather Boy is quite Boy. Max Portery. Very um, very Lanny Lanny. Lanny. Yeah, I think yeah. I was reading Lanny when that um, oh, okay, that when, makes I, when sense. I wrote that. There's yeah. a lot about and there's a, there's like the Lanny a book where like you have an entire being made out of both the landscape and what's been left on the yeah. landscape. Old Papa Toothwalker, is that his oh, name? Papa Toothwalk, Old yeah. Papa Toothwalk. There might even be a note about um, Lanny in this. Feather boy. Someone found his body in the woods, edged in fox spit and leaking squirrels, wrenched crisp packets and aerosols, ring pulls and quiet killings, shotgun cartridges and dog shit, beaters sticks and laughing gas canisters. His beak was cracked open, and the earth was in his mouth. Maybe it was a BB gun that got him. Or the mercy of a cat's clean teeth. It would be best to leave his body where it is. But someone takes it home. Makes a meal of plucking feather from bone, father from son. Once stripped, the skeleton is sprayed silver as a Christmas decoration. Sternum, ribcage and skull laid out like tools on a work table. Someone rearranges the body and leaves him hanging from the ceiling, unable to take flight. You say that obviously you love to perform, mm -hmm. but also, I mean, I've... The first time I saw you perform these, I've seen you perform stuff online, but the first time I've seen it in person was right here in your living yeah. room when we recorded these poems. Um, so before then, I've only known them as written down poems in the book, and that's how I've received them. Hmm. How important is it to you, actually, the way that it looks on the page versus how it then translates to when you're reading it? See, that's a good question. Not that any of the questions you've asked so far haven't been good questions, <laughs> but people like ask questions about like the page stage divide, and I'm like, mm. I don't care! <laughs> I'll give a lot of credit to Jane Kamein, who uh, is my editor, and she thinks a lot about stuff like does there need to be a comma at the end of this line? Does the line break do the work for that, etc.? I think a lot about form. There are poems in here that uh, there's a sevenling, which is a, an odd kind of little poem. Uh, there are sonnets. Uh, there are ones that just have very strict sort of like A, B, A, B rhyme. There's a terzerima. Um So like, and, and the, you know, the boy poems are all um, sort of like these block of mm. prose yeah. um, that in their own way follow particular structures and syntax and like a sort of form that has become its own little thing. Mm -hmm. um, so like form is really important to me because the point about publishing a book is that it exists outside of me, right? It exists when I'm not there. It exists for you alone reading a poem. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I think hard about like how it looks on the page. I, I have like sort of, I suppose, almost anxieties about it. I remember somebody saying to me quite early on, like, God, all your poems really hug the left-hand margin. And so I really wanted to make sure that like not all my poems just existed in uh, like, like loop in your brain. Like, yeah, can't yeah, yeah, hug yeah. The left -hand margin. Um, and so like that's why there are poems like Shaving Tips or yeah. um, uh, Waterway uh, or a few others where like uh, I really try and spread the poem out across the page and use mm. like that space and whether it's for breath whether it's for pause whether it's for like the idea that an audience's thoughts can be sort of inserted into that moment mm. brilliant and there are ways in which some of those things are then reflected on stage right so with frightened rabbit there's a lot of space but also like the space sort of closes as the poem goes on mm. um and so when i'm performing it i'm thinking like right which bit where am i going quickly where am i going slowly 
what thoughts need to all run onto one another, what thoughts need to be interrupted. And I think that that is also represented in how it is on, on the page. It took mm-hmm. ages to find what the form was for that. Yeah. Same when there's a poem called Shadow Boxing, which is um, intersected by double slashes. And I always thought, like, I never knew why people did that in poems. I always thought it was like a secret that somebody had done and didn't tell me about. Like, yeah. why do we use double slashes in poems? And then somebody edited it and just said, like, oh, like, you, that, that can be, like, a sort of, like, double punch because it's about boxing. Um, oh, right. And so, I, so in that sort of content mirroring form, that's quite a, a neat yeah. little thing. But then other people are going to read it very differently. Some people are going to read it as breath. And some people are going to read it as pretentious. That's fine. I, I like that there are three poems uh, called Teas, Wind and Gifts, which are all love poems. So they're all sonnets. They actually all sort of like slide together as well, but they're about the slightly disgusting side of love. Like, you know, they're about farting in bed or mm. um, about doing a very unsexy strip tease for your partner or uh, watching a cat eat a mouse. Um, and so like, I, I, I thought the sonnet was a really useful sort of like package for them. Mm. And in performance, like I love reading a sonnet. Firstly, it's easy to remember. Yeah. And secondly, um, it's a really nice length to read to somebody else, read to a, to an audience. They sort of know it's ended because there's a rhyming couplet. Mm. Um, like, it's it's clear. Um, and then there's a sonnet at the very end, which is uh, for my mate Tom. And I like the idea that that is a love poem for, for another man, for another boy. And again, it, none of those sort of matter that they are sonnets unless either you're reading it and you go, oh, that's a sonnet. That can improve my understanding of love or of relationships or whatever um or you don't have to identify that it's a sonnet but like if you hear the rhymes and they are pleasing to you and they sort of like and then you realize that one of them is like slightly off kilter Mm -hmm. so maybe it is again in terms of like content mirroring form this sort of like representation of a slightly different kind of relationship or an attempt to move away from uh a stereotypical or homogenized idea of what uh a relationship whether like heterosexual or homosexual looks like or homosocial right or like between two men in a non-sexual environment um so yeah those are the ways that i use form both to like in allow the book to breathe on its own Mm. and also to allow me to utilize it in performance Mm -hmm. i don't know if you'll like answering this one that's all right you can ask me um so you we started this by talking about why you wanted and needed to write about boyhood Mm -hmm. and you said that it was you know um never really understanding what a boy was or like not being being unsure about that term Mm -hmm. is there anything that you wish you could tell your younger self now about that that is a difficult question to answer because I don't want to portray a narrative of um, what doesn't kill you make you stronger, right? I don't want to portray a narrative of, oh, you have to go through this shit to become the person that you are. The reality is that the anxieties in this book, the complications, the upset, the fear, the anger, were things that I went through and that I understand now in a different way, in a better way. And and I I do, I wish for a different history. I wish for a different um, life in some ways. I wish I wasn't, I wish I didn't act in certain ways. I wish I didn't think in certain ways. Um, but I am also much better now I'm I think a very happy person now I wouldn't have described myself as a happy person when I was writing this book Um, I'm quite an optimistic person now definitely wouldn't have described myself that way ever. Um, I always would have described myself as a warrior all the time. Um, and I don't describe myself that way anymore. 
not necessarily because it's not true, but just because it's not useful. Um, so in terms of what I would say to my younger self, I mean, one of the things is like, go and talk to a mental health professional earlier. Don't think that all your trauma has to become art. Um, even stuff like read more, like doesn't actually seem to fit because I'm like, I'm always going to wish I moved, I, re I read more and I don't want to live in that sort of regretful self chastisement. Try not to be a dick. Um, and don't make corduroy to a club because it's, it's really hot. My final actual final question mm -hmm. is, um, off topic. It's simply that we are here in Norwich where you live. Mm. Um, do you have any good, any favourite writing spots in the city? In Norwich? Mm -hmm. Depends what you mean by writing. Okay. I'm aware that I'm really not doing any of the things that an interview <laughs> yeah. subject like. Um, because like the idea of like sitting down and writing with a notebook. Like, right, I have to have this specific notebook, or I've got to have my laptop, or I've got to have this and this and this and this and this, all in a particular place for me to make anything, right? I had a, such a good go at making an office upstairs that I would feel comfortable writing in. Yeah. It's not really worked. Mm. Yesterday I sat in the Millennium Library in Norwich mm -hmm. um, and I bought um, a cheap notebook and some pens and planned uh, the next show that I'm going to do mm. um, and read some books and made some notes and I sort of didn't have any rules for myself. I just sort of like slowly evolved in, and it was just like the right time in the right place. Yeah. However, writing as a sort of like broader concept, right, uh, as in like we are not just writing when we're sat down putting pen to paper, especially not with poems, right? Mm. The poems are short, they don't take that long, and this sort of like image of the writer, I always think of um, uh, Ewan McGregor in Moulin Rouge. Oh um, my god, yeah. Right? Um, and like he has this idea of what a writer is going to be, mm -hmm. and Baz Luhrmann sort of, he's, he, I, I think Luhrmann understands uh, the, the trouble with what he's doing is how do you cinematically represent the act of writing, mm. which is actually an incredibly sedentary, dull, still process, right? If you watched me writing, I'm not really doing much. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not entertainment. So you've got to show somebody banging at a keyboard and ripping off pages <laughs> and throwing things away. And then, or you've got to get like the big sort of like crime scene image <laughs> yeah. of like, this links to this and this goes to that trying to capture uh, this thing that is, is mostly internal, it's quite difficult. So when you ask like, where are the best writing spots? I'm like, I don't know, I run around a park and have some ideas, um, mm -hmm. or I uh, sit in a cafe, or I sit on my sofa and watch telly, um, and I write while I do those things. A boy in a blue suit. In the changing room, a boy strips down to his boxers before folding himself into a new three-piece skin. Mirrors bounce boy back at himself. He pulls trousers up, buckles. He looks at this blue, blue, blue shape and mimes all possible movement. Bends, reaches, dances. He whispers a secret to himself. You look beautiful boy, before he buttons himself into the ocean and brushes his waves of flesh. He braces for the outside world, prepares for the ooze, for the ahs, like he is the spark of blue in the middle of every flame. <laughs>